Welcome to the Thunder and Lightning Show. Today we're going to address people who say that the SSPX are schismatics. We're going to take a look at some of the Vatican II documents and see what they say. So Ryan, what uh, Vatican II document did you research? Well, I looked into Lumen Gentium. This was brought up. What's interesting is, I don't know if I discussed this with you, but I pointed this out to other people. That, you know, some of these people who were high on their horse or whatever said, SSPX is schismatic. They're outside the church, all this. And yet, the, okay, all right, you say that. Now, but also, you're, you're a firm believer in Vatican II, right? Oh, yes, Vatican II. We're right there in the church with Vatican II. And SSPX is not in the church. And so then the question is, wait a minute. What does Vatican II about people say about people who are outside the church, whether they're non-Christians or Protestants or Eastern Orthodox? Isn't it really like... Uh, ironic and uh, doesn't it have all these great things to say about people who are uh, outside the church or not in full communion uh, what do you have to say to that well uh, uh, I have to go uh, I have a roast in the oven bye bye so that, with that in mind we wanted to take a look at what Vatican II actually says about people who are uh, outside the church and, and what that actually means so Lumen Gentium this is number 15. So it begins, The church recognizes that in many ways she is linked with those who, being baptized, are honored with the name of Christian, though they do not profess the faith in its entirety. Now let's stop right there. This is talking about Protestants because it says they do not profess the faith in its entirety. So if you believe everything that the Catholic Church teaches, this doesn't apply to you. But let's continue. Or do not preserve unity of communion with the successor of Peter. So that would be the Eastern Orthodox, because we don't have communion with them, and they don't acknowledge the Pope as the head. Now, does any of this apply to anybody who's a Catholic, whether you're SSPX um, or some kind of flavor of traditionalist? No, because you do believe, you believe in the papacy, you have a unity of communion with him, and you acknowledge that. Now, you get into the question of the set of the contest. They do acknowledge the unity of communion, and uh, the problem is they say that this guy who's pope is not really pope, so we're not in communion with him. But that's not what we're going to discuss for right now. Continuing, For there are many who honor sacred scripture, taking it as a norm of belief and a pattern of life, and who show a sincere zeal. Now let's fast forward here. Again, it's talking about Protestants. Uh, they are consecrated by baptism, in which they are united with Christ. They also recognize and accept other sacraments within their own churches or ecclesiastical communities. Many of them rejoice in the Episcopate, this would be the Eastern Orthodox, celebrate the Holy Eucharist, and cultivate devotion toward the, the Virgin Mother of God. They also share with us in prayer and other spiritual benefits. Likewise, we can say that in some real way they are joined with us in the Holy Spirit. For to them too he gives his graces, his gifts and graces, whereby he is operative among them with his sanctifying power. So let's pause right here and say, if you can say these great things about the Eastern Orthodox, that in some way some real way they are joined with us in the Holy Spirit for to them too he gives his gifts and graces whereby he is operated operative among them with his sanctifying power if you can say that about the Eastern Orthodox who reject Catholic doctrines and the papacy then let's what would what would Vatican II say about SSBX who believe everything the church teaches and uh, accept that, that Francis is the true Pope uh, they were they lovingly they gushed over the Eastern Orthodox. So I mean, they would probably write their own document about SSPX and say how great they are. They too believe in the papacy and celebrate the liturgy of the Church worthily and have a fond love, a great love of the traditions of the Catholic Church. I mean, they would write something like that. Would they ever say anything? Would Vatican II ever say anything bad about the SSPX? No. They would, ignore, they would ignore all disputes and say just the best things about them. Um, so 
with that in mind, I mean, let's just, again, let's just look at uh, Vatican II and, and see how optimistic and positive it is about those who are outside the church or in a strange situation of communion um, or maybe slightly estranged from the mainstream church. Vatican II says things are great, and these people, they share with us in the, the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So anybody who's going to say like, oh, things are terrible, they're outside the church, they're not, uh, that's not Vatican II. You're off on your own now. And so if you really believe in Vatican II, then you have to say that these people are inside the church, and at, at worst, they share with the Holy Spirit, uh, they're joined in a real way with us, and the Holy Spirit is at work giving them graces and gifts. He's operative among them with his sanctifying power. That's the worst thing that you could say about SSPX based on reading Vatican II. And um, by the way, there are links to every papal document on the Vatican's website. I will link these documents below that we talk about. Um, yeah, by the way, that was Lumen Gentium chapter 15, which deals with Christians of various stripes. 16 deals with uh, non-Christians. And what the SSPX have said about Vatican II, I believe Bishop Fillet says he agrees with 95% of the Vatican II documents. So we're just looking at the 5% where we kind of have some problems with. Um, is that all you have for Lumen Gentium? Yeah, there's a little bit in 16, but I don't know if that's worth reading at this time. I don't know if any of it's really worth reading. <laughs> <laughs> especially, when I, especially what I'm coming up with. But, well, you know what, though? No, uh, Nostra Aetate. You're reading Nostra Aetate, which is, I think, far, which, far worse. Than it's Lumen shocking. <laughs> Here's the thing. Let me preface Nostra Aetate. Though. Okay. E. Michael Jones has pointed this out. I don't know if it's at the beginning or the end of that where there's that explanatory note. But because that thing was so radical... Somebody asked a question in the council, and, and, and then they put it in the document. And in the document itself, it says, we're not changing anything about the church's relationship with non-Catholic religions and the duties that the state has towards the Catholic church. So Vatican II, Nostra Aetate, says we're not changing anything. But then with that in mind, if you read the document, they're trying to do all this radical departure from what the church's relationship was with with uh, non-Christian religions, because I think that document's just about non-Christian religions, and I think it's also about uh, the church-state relations. But um, it's a, it turns into a complete contradiction. But the bottom line is the council taught that Nostra Aetate changes nothing. Which is not true, as we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, it pretends to do something. As E. Michael Jones has said, Bad guys tried to make Nostra Aetate depart from the tradition of the church, but by God's grace and the Holy Spirit, they wrote that in there that it changes nothing. So you can continue. And this is, Nostra Aetate is pretty short, so if you have 10 minutes, I mean, go ahead and read through it. I'm just going to try to read through it pretty quick. Um, number two, it says, Religions, however, that are bound up with an advanced culture and have struggled to answer the same questions by means of more refined concept and more developed language. Thus, in Hinduism, men contemplate the divine mystery and express it through an inexhaustible abundance of myths and through searching philosophical inquiry. They seek freedom from the anguish of our human condition, either through aesthetical practices or profound meditation or a flight to God with love and trust. Again, Buddhism, is in its various forms, realizes the radical insufficiency of this changeable world it teaches a way by which men, in a devout and confident spirit, may be able to either acquire a state of perfect liberation or attain by their own efforts or through higher help, supreme illumination. Likewise, other religions found everywhere try to counter the restlessness of the human heart, each in its own manner, by proposing ways, comprising teachings, rules of life, and sacred rites. The Catholic Church rejects nothing that is true and holy in these religions. I'm going to skip a little bit forward. Indeed, she proclaims and ever must proclaim Christ, the way, the truth, and the life, in whom men may find the fullness of religious life, in whom God has reconciled all things to himself. So, this quote, where they quoted John chapter 14, verse 6, the way, the truth, and the life, they left off the end of the quote. <laughs> you know what that is? What is it? Jesus saith to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
no man cometh to the Father but by me. So they, they use a quote that contradicted what they're trying to say. They cut off the second part and said, oh, well, Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life. But, well, these religions are still good, though, even though Jesus says, you can't come to the Father except by me. Oh, well, they, they try to seek God in their own ways. So, I mean, I, I don't get it. Like, I, I just, this is so bad. Like, th this is pretty unbelievable. <clears throat> I can go further on. Well, let me just pause point. there. I think, though, the, the whole purpose of this document was this was just some kind of, like, super-duper pastoral thing. Uh, mo most of Vatican II is the equivalent of a synod of bishops. So, you know, Pope Francis gets together. He's like, hey, I got this pre-cooked document. Let's go in here and search our feelings and see what we feel. And let's have some kids up here and sing a song. And we'll clap like Tegel. And we'll snap our fingers. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then we'll vote on some stupid stuff that says you can get a divorce, okay? That's basically what they did in Vatican II for most of this stuff. The bishops were like, man, I really want to go home. And all we're doing is discussing this stupid stuff about, like, who Buddhists are praying to and what great things Hindus are doing. So what the whole purpose of this was is let's say some good things about other people because it's 1965 now. And we don't want to get into World War III, and uh, let's try to get along with everybody. So let's find, uh, here's, a, here's a Buddhist, let's say some good things about this Buddhist. Well, you practice a very disciplined lifestyle, and you truly are seeking uh, enlightenment. And, um, well, uh, we Catholics can give you... Uh, uh, we have asceticism too, and we're also seeking enlightenment. So we're in some ways kind of the same here. Um, now, saying that is okay. You now said that, and it's an opportunity for for an opportunity to evangelize and say, but you know that unfortunately Buddhism really can't save you because as Christ said, no one comes to the Father except by me. So let me now uh, preach Christ crucified to you and uh, invite you to join the church, become baptized, so you can save your soul. And so that is like part one uh, of this whole process. And, but if you just stick right there, then you're not doing what the church wants you to do. So if you put that Nostra Aetate in its, in its own place, it's not horrific. Um, at, least that, at least what I heard right there. <laughs> Yeah, well, it, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but wait, there's more. <laughs> yeah, there's more. There's the Mohammedans yeah. um, in Chapter 3. Now, I don't know, did you watch uh, Tim Flanders' video, The Meaning of Catholic? Yeah, the Mohammed. Video on the Mohammed. That was really one. good. That mean, was yeah. really interesting. I'm not going to cover very much. I think he actually quotes Nostra Tate in his video. Perhaps, yeah. Um, so I was like, oh, well, I was, was going to talk about that. But I'll, I'll mention just a little bit. Um, I underlined one thing here. It says... Uh, well, it says the church regards with esteem also the Muslims. Uh, they adore the one God, living and subsisting in himself. It just goes on and it says, Though they do not acknowledge Jesus as God, they revere him as a prophet. Which would be a reason to criticize them, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because Jesus said, like Jesus said, I am the Messiah, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so if you revere him as a prophet, that's, that's inconsistent logic. I don't know. It just it just doesn't. That's also where they said. Out. Is that the document also where it says we together with the Muslims worship the one God, and it says together no beast which Father Hesse has pointed out so much that that he thinks it's a heresy. I think that, that might have been a different it, one. Actually, that might be in Lumenchensium. <laughs> it's like yeah. Musulmani um, adorant Deum unum nobiscum. It's like the Mos the Muslims worship one God with us, and that's what he finds problematic. Like we is that saying that we share the same understanding of God and that the way we worship them or adore him is the same way they do? If that's the case, then that's heresy and blasphemy. And he makes uh, some arguments from that perspective. No, I don't think it says that. Yeah, it's probably um, in Lumen it's, Gentium. Yeah, then. Uh, so it's, it's sure. all just... They all have interfaith stuff in them. Oh, here it is. It's in the, this is it. It's in Lumen Gentium 16. In the first place among these, there are the Muslims who, professing to hold the faith of Abraham, along with us, adore the one and merciful God 
who on the last day will judge mankind. And he points out that that's problematic. Along with us, adore the one and merciful God. And he also says, since the course of centuries, not a few quarrels and hostilities have arisen between Christians and Muslims. Yeah, that's not surprising. This sacred sin of this sacred synod urges all to forget the past and work sincerely for mutual understanding. Well, I mean, I guess that would be helpful not to declare wars, but... Not to chop off heads would be a yeah, nice first step. Forcible conversions. But, I mean, that's got... There's, if, if we're going to work towards a mutual understanding, you both need a mutual goal. That would be helpful. That would be. <laughs> it seems like Vatican II is saying, let's not chop heads. And so... Uh, the problem is that the guys who chop heads are not on board with this at all. So, uh, and the guys who are in charge are not stopping the head choppers. So if you're not stopping the head choppers, then are you against the head choppers? Or are you not really in charge? Or what's going on here? Um, and unfortunately, uh, you know, back in 65 though, nobody was, as far as I understand, nobody was chopping heads in 1965. There was no Muslim Islamic terrorism. Mohammedan terrorism did not exist in 1965. My understanding is that that kind of stuff only happened after um, 67, like the war with Israel, the uprising, this jihad stuff, Osama bin Laden, uh, the, the bombings in Lebanon. That's my understanding. I could be wrong. Of course, we know in the Middle Ages they were kidnapping people. They were chopping heads. They were doing forced conversions. All right, and we're going to move on to the Jews, number four. Um, it just it says the Church of Christ professes that all who believe in Christ, Abraham's sons according to the faith, are included in the same patriarch's call. Indeed, the Church believes that by his cross, Christ, our peace, reconciled the Jews and Gentiles, making both one in himself. Yeah, I mean, they did, but... But he did that by baptism and not by just because Christ came and Gentiles entered the church does not mean the Jews are, who reject Christ are part of the church. So it skips... Is it like papering over the fact that the Jews reject Christ? Um, I think it might mention I think that's, it. Let me... Well, what you read, read that again, please. It, it wasn't a complete... Oh, okay. Yeah, I just, I kind of skipped forward. I don't see, uh, it, I think it does mention the Jews rejecting Christ, but okay. they were like, oh, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> Never so, mind, the Son of God just died on the cross. Okay. Well, here it says, true, the Jewish authorities and those who followed their lead pressed for the death of Christ. Still, what happened in his passion cannot be charged against all the Jews without distinction then alive nor against the Jews of today. Well, you know, E. Michael Jones points out, yeah, because we can count on a hand a certain number of Jews who were not for the crucifixion of Christ, and that would be the Blessed Mother, St. John the Apostle, Nicodemus, all the apostles, the, whole, the holy women who were there crying and weeping. They are some Jews who were against the crucifixion of Christ. So Vatican II in that respect is correct. Not all Jews were for the crucifixion of Christ. <laughs> well, they say, although the church is the new people of God, the Jews should not be presented as rejected or cursed by God as if this followed them from the Holy Scriptures. Well, let's look at the Holy Scriptures. Yeah, what do the Holy Scriptures say about that? <laughs> Matthew chapter 27, verses 24 and 5. <laughs> and Pilate, seeing that he prevailed nothing, but that rather in a tumult was made, uh, taking water, washed his hands before the people, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. Look you to it. And the whole people answering said, His blood be upon us and our children. So this is the Jews bringing the curse upon their future generations yeah. by crucifying Christ. So I don't know. I mean, I, I guess they didn't really reference, they didn't really want to reference that Bible verse. In this <laughs> they, they papered over that, yeah. <laughs> Or the one where uh, St. Paul says that the Jews who pers the Jews, he says it, are the enemies of all mankind. This is in like Second Thessalonians or whatever, because they oppose the preaching of the gospel. And um, so the Vatican II skipped over that part. Um, and again, you know, again, not all Jews were there screaming, "Crucify him!" Because there were a lot of Jews, according to the flesh 
who accepted Christ as the Messiah and became baptized, who were against the crucifixion. So through that equivocation, uh, Vatican II can say that. And this is the problem, is that you just take a term, okay, and you mush it a little bit, and then you can say something nice about the Jews. Like, uh, oh, not every Jew was uh, for the crucifixion of Christ. Yeah, okay. But then by your definition, not every Jew rejected Christ, and some of those Jews were baptized. So are those people, what are they? Are they Jews? Are they Christians, according to your definition? Well, uh, uh, let's not talk about that. Hey, we have interreligious dialogue now. Hey, let's have matzo soup together. Hey, I like your hat. Hey. Yeah, and um, it, I think one thing they might be getting at is they don't want anti-Semitism to drive like another Holocaust. Correct, and that's a legitimate and thing. It's like, hey, okay, let's not kill these people. They've been persecuted pretty good in the last like I don't know, 50 years or whatever. But then you can make a statement. Forcible conversions are not good. Persecuting people based on religion right. are not good. You could have said that. You could have been very straightforward. You could have said, Siku Judeus non, this is the way we're going to treat the Jews, which is the tradition of the church. E. Michael Jones is like the expert of this. He wrote the book, several books. Well, let's just talk about his book, Jewish Revolution. Uh, he talked about the book, he wrote the book, The Jewish Revolutionary Spirit, which talks about how um, some of the problems amongst the um, the Jews and uh, the problem stems from the rejection of Christ and they continue to war against him um, and that, that's the problem it doesn't have anything to do with this silly idea of race or any of this stuff but it has to do with their rejection of Christ and that's the problem and so the church and the church had a policy of the Jews which was written in uh, some papal bull I don't know if the name of the bull is Siku Judeus Non or not. I'm not sure. But anyway, so the rules were, okay, don't harm the Jews. Don't disrupt their services. Don't just desecrate their cemeteries. We're going we're gonna to allow them to live here peacefully. Um, we're not going to harm them. But then in the same way they're not allowed to harm us, they can't propagandize us. They can't blaspheme Christ. They can't corrupt our morals through whatever means that they might use, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we, there was this peace treaty that existed, and um, Vatican II could have kind of restated that peace treaty, but it was trying to do something new. And this is all the fault of the Hitlerists, because they were the guys who broke from Christianity, and they tried to set up this new post-Christian society, which is based on race and blood and Darwinism and atheism and paganism, and for some reason, they had it out for the Jews. Namely, be one reason given was because, well, they're just wandering around and they're not a real people that's stuck to the land with this blood and soil stuff. And they're like a virus, you know, that's taken over uh, all of Europe and we need to get rid of this virus or whatever. And so none of this had anything to do with Christ. This had to do with Darwinism and uh and the false theories of uh nietzsche and, and hegel and those guys and so those were the bad guys that went and persecuted the jews not christians okay uh none of the bishops of vatican ii were like uh running pogroms and and, and and putting people in concentration camps so we don't need to do any apologizing uh the the bad guys have to do the apologizing now, the last thing I had, I just wanted to quote the Father Lassant's Missal, page 484. This is for Good Friday. Um, and the Father Lassant's Missal is a free or the pre-1955 Missal. So with the pre-1955 Holy Week, I mean, I think it's kind of similar in the new Holy Week where they have the Liturgy of the Word, uh, the prayers in between. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I'm quoting the prayers in between. Let us pray for also the heretics and schismatics that our Lord and God may deliver them from all their errors and vouchsafe to recall them to their Holy Mother the Catholic and Apostolic Church. Let us pray also for the unfaithful Jews, that our Lord and God may take away the veil from their hearts, so that they too may acknowledge Jesus Christ our Lord. It says, Repel us not even Jewish faithlessness from thy mercy. Hearken our prayers, which we make in behalf of the blindness of that people, that recognizing the light of thy truth, which is Christ, they may be delivered from their darkness. 
then finally it says, Let us pray also for the pagans, that Almighty God may remove iniquity from their hearts, so that they may leave their idols and be converted to the living and true God, and His only Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. No wonder they changed pre-1955 Holy, Holy Week. Week yeah. <laughs> Although I will say that in the when they changed the Holy Week, they kept the text of those prayers exactly the same up until it was John the 23rd who took out the word perfidious because he said, oh, that's negative or whatever. But the thing is, as I pointed this out before, never on this channel, but to other people, the reason why he uses the word perfidious is so that there's no confusion about who we're praying for here. Because you're not praying for the Jews because there's some Jews, uh, according to the flesh, who believe in Christ who are inside the church. So to prevent any kind of confusion and make it clear that we're not praying for just this race of people, who we're praying for is those faithless people, the faithless Jews who have rejected Christ and stayed outside the church. Again, there's a ton of good Catholics who uh, were formerly Jews and are Jews according to the flesh now, uh, like Roy Shulman, like Mother Miriam, like Bob Fishman. There's probably, those are the three who come to mind who are quite well known. Um, and those, those people are inside the church. We're not praying for them. I mean, we already prayed for them because they're the Catholic faithful. But now we're praying for those Jews who are faithless, who don't believe in Christ, who have rejected him, and they're outside the church. And so that's why that word is very important. And by the way, those prayers, this was pointed out on New Liturgical Movement, which did an excellent series of articles about the Good Friday prayers. Those prayers are really old. They're back to like the 400s, 300s, 200s. We've been praying those prayers since then, and every one of those things that it says is directly from the scriptures. When it talked about the idols, when it talked about the veil over the eyes of the Jews, um, it said, what was the next motif that was after it talked about the veil over the eyes? Oh, the blindness of the, the Jews. Blindness. That All this stuff is from St. Paul in the New Testament. You're quoting from him himself, St. Paul, who was, a, according to the flesh, a Jew, who then believed in Jesus Christ, blessed be his holy name, and wrote most of the books of the New Testament. Okay? So, uh, if you want to know about the Jews and what the whole deal is, St. Paul will tell you all about that thing, because he used to, he's, according to the flesh, a Jew, and he tried really hard uh, to, convert, to convert them. But they kept putting roadblocks in, in his way and persecuting him. He was none too happy about it. Before we conclude, uh, Ryan had something about the Jew prayer, the pre-55 yeah, Jew prayer. Yeah, and what you had just read about um, uh, from the Father Lassance Missal. But what's interesting is, um, so I made some remarks about that, and I wanted to, uh, to give you the whole story. Uh, I attended the pre-55 Holy Week the last two years, and so... Um, you know, this past year in secret, I mean, just a, a month ago, in a secret undisclosed location deep in the catacombs, we prayed the, uh, the pre-55 liturgy, and so we prayed the prayer for the perfidious Jews. Now, what's interesting is when Pope Benedict uh, liberalized the Old Mass, he actually composed a new prayer for the Jews in the, in the Good Friday because he didn't even like the John the 23rd prayer, which was the original prayer just with the word perfidious taken out. So he wrote his own thing, which he thought was like less confrontational or less critical or whatever. Now, I think his prayer is both based on scripture, um, that it's also based on scripture. But we mentioned that John the 23rd changed the prayer in um, 19... Was it 60, 62? I'm not even sure. But I wanted to read the, uh, the here's the date. John the 23rd changed the prayer of March 21st, 1959. He took out the word perfidious. Um, then there was a 1973 um, Jew prayer and the Good Friday. It says they were the first to hear the word of God. May they grow in love according to faithfulness to his covenant. You gave a promise to Abraham. May the people that you first made your own, may, may they arrive at the fullness of redemption. Okay, so it's calling them to conversion. Then Pope Benedict wrote his Jew prayer, that, God, that our God and Lord may illuminate their hearts, that they acknowledge Jesus Christ as the Savior of all, Almighty and eternal God, who want that all men be saved and come to the recognition of the truth, 
propitiously grant that even as the fullness of the peoples enters thy church, all Israel be saved. That's a direct quote from uh, Pope, uh, sorry, that's a direct quote from St. Paul. Um, so, but anyway, that wasn't enough for the ADL, and they complained about this. Um, so, so the, the ADL complain about this. And these, these, the ADL is not going to be happy unless you're not praying for the Jews, and unless you're clapping and saying, you're okay, you don't need Christ, what do you need him for? You're the children of Abraham, and boy, that's just good enough. But again, what did Christ say about that? He said, um, if you were the children of Abraham, you wouldn't be trying to crucify me. And if you were the children of Abraham, you would believe in me. Abraham saw my day, and he rejoiced in it. And, and then that's when they got in dispute, and he said, I am. And then they took up stones to try to crucify him. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about that prayer and the fact that, so, you know, even in the pre-55, if you go to one that's mainstream or whatever, uh, at least celebrated by FSSP or Institute of Christ the King, they're going to pray the Benedict the Sixteen Jew prayer. And if you go to the Novus Ordo, they're going to pray the, I guess there was another version of a Jew prayer in 1998. I mean, this is so ridiculous. It's like every new, every five years or ten years, let's have a new prayer for the Jews. Oh, well, which way is the wind blowing? What's our relationship with the Jews? Okay, well, let's pray this. Why couldn't you just stick with the prayer that existed for like a thousand years? You know, and all of a sudden you got to do all this changing. Um, it just bespeaks some kind of uh, lack of confidence that the church is not really sure about who it is or uh, what are the Jews, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, so, so they're always changing these things. And, um, but I wanted to point that out, that uh, that prayer, you're probably not going to find prayed by anybody except, in, you know, you'll find a good priest who will pray the original prayer diocesan typically because fraternity of saint peter institute of christ the king their hands are tied sspx is going to say the prayer from 62 which is I, that prayer without perfidious in it um so again it's just kind of a mess with this whole thing and i wanted to uh to clarify that all right well thank you ryan thank you Th peace thank you, thank you so much for watching and the sspx are not schismatics <laughs>